I'm Dave Cauley, investigative journalist and host of the podcast, Cold. In October of 1985, a woman named Cherie Warren left work at a busy Salt Lake City office. To meet her estranged husband at a downtown auto dealership. She never made it home. Cherie's car surfaced weeks later in Las Vegas. In the parking lot of a hotel casino. No one knows how it got there. Strange. It was strange. Both Cherie's estranged husband and her boyfriend raised suspicion for investigators. I kind of thought that he might have done something. But no arrests were ever made. In Cold Season 3, we dig into double lives, make new connections in the case, and examine the difficulty raised by reasonable doubt. We want answers just as much as anyone else. They have creeps like that now, too, so nothing's changed. That's the new Cold Season 3, The Search for Cherie. Now available anywhere you get your podcasts. In today's episode of Project Recovery, I think that's what 2020 has taught me is that I am a lot stronger than I ever believed. Uh, It's challenged our sense of financial stability, emotional stability, social stability. Um, So many things that we just used to take for granted uh, have come into question this year. Make sure you listen to the end. Find us on Facebook at Project Recovery. We'll have that and much more coming up. Welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction. More importantly, it's about recovering. It's brought to you by our friends at knowyourscript.org. They used to be use only as directed, but they're opening up their uh, their wings. They're letting it fly. They're spreading them. Use only as directed was a great concept, and it is a great concept. But I think their new uh, campaign is is more broad, right? Because we talk about uh, know your script with your doctor. Do you go in and actually ask questions? I am flabbergasted at how many people tell me they're sort of intimidated to talk to their doctor about their diagnosis, about their medications. And that's dangerous, especially if you're talking about opiate medications. You know, and they usually just take it as a matter of fact. The right. doctor told me it must be okay. And I don't know how many guests we've had on this podcast who got into their addiction through a legal prescription. We should we should uh, look at a percentage because it is high. Yeah. I mean, and, and then to have them tell us stories of things they have done that they never thought they'd be capable of doing. That's how dark the disease can take you. So know your script when talking to your doctor. Also know your script when talking to yourself, you know, and, and going, what am I OK with? Yeah. Are you being honest with yourself about your own history of addiction, whether you actually have struggled with substance abuse? Uh, do you overdo it too too often with, with drinking and things like that? And do you have a family history of, of substance abuse and, and substance problems? Those are things for you to, to get right with and know that you may be at risk. And I think the third part is probably one that cut, touches really close to our hearts is that know your script when talking to your children. Definitely. Because, uh, you know, they don't understand. And we want to tell them how this could really end up. What are the potentials? You just had a son who had his triple nipple removed. Right. (laughs) And, uh, you know, is he going to get opioids or is he going to be okay bouncing back and forth between Tylenol and ibuprofen? That's what we did. That's what he and I talked about it. And we talked about how this isn't the sort of thing where that level of medications required. And he agreed. And and we went with went with the lesser ones because he and I talked about it. But, you know, it's it starts with are you are you educated yourself on the medicines and then are you willing to talk to your kids and educate them? You know, and the other thing is, is that whenever we talk about the opioid epidemic or we talk about uh, the medication, there's always somebody who says, I need this medication. And I say, you know what, that medication does do its job. It is for a certain right. ailment, you know, uh, but we wanted to make sure everybody knows everything that can happen. Well, I think having a plan is part of knowing your script, and there should be a plan to phase it out. So we are not suggesting that you should never use opiate medications post-surgery and in, in similar situations. Um Work with your doctor. Make sure that you have a plan. And usually a a small number of pills over a certain period of time is enough, and then you can transition to something like Tylenol. Mm -hmm. Um, But make that a plan with your doctor, and you'll you'll be fine if you stick to that plan. So lately I've been walking around, uh, and when I see people out on the street and they say they love the podcast room at the gym, uh, you know, they go, how are you doing? And my standard joke right now is, I picked the wrong year to get sober. (laughs) 
2020 has just been a butt kicker. Well, it's the year most people chose to to get drunk. Yeah, <laughs> because you know, and, there's and a high rate of of drinking this year. People are isolating. They're yeah. staying at home. And so, uh, actually, I just got done doing another podcast. And so we do Dad Tastic. I do it with Tom Hackett. I know. I saw Tom in the um, elevator. Elevator, and he, he wished me a happy holidays. Yeah. And so we were talking about this, and I said, uh, if I've learned one thing through 2020, is that if I can stay sober during the dumpster fire of a year that 2020 has been, yeah. then I think I can do it for the rest of my life. Yeah, I really truly believe that. That's a good point. You know, and we were talking with Tom on the other podcast about how he's been fighting with his wife a little bit more than normal. Mm. And I said, you could apply that same logic to that. Mm -hmm. If you can make it through 2020 as a couple. You can do anything. Right? Right. And so I think that's what 2020 has taught me is that I am a lot stronger than I ever believed. I think that's a great that that's a great realization. It really is. Uh, we were talking about uh, you know what have we learned from 2020. That's a wonderful realization because 2020 has challenged. Uh, it's challenged our sense of financial stability, emotional stability, social stability. Um, so many things that we just used to take for granted. Uh, have come into question this year, and we've almost made it through. And now, what's happening up here in uh, Salt Lake City is uh, f- uh, physicians and frontline healthcare workers are getting the vaccine, and and uh, I'll be getting it probably in a month. And and by the time you know spring rolls around, hopefully most people will have been able to have it, and maybe this 2020 will finally be over. But it's tested us in so many different ways. You know, and the crazy thing is, is that the world will be forever changed. Because of 2020. Right. And it has taught us so many different things about ourselves. There's been so many moments of self introspection that I've, I've had on multiple levels. I mean, we can go back to the earthquake. And I thought to myself when the earthquake happened, right? Am I prepared? Yeah, right, exactly. A- you we? know, because I, as long as I've lived in Utah and it's been 46 years, everybody's always talked about an earthquake. Mm-hmm. Are you prepared? Mm-hmm. But then at some point, it just became white noise. It's like something that would throw out a party. Somebody would say, I live on the fault. If it does happen, my house is going to be swallowed. And right. nobody ever really thought that there was going to be an earthquake. Uh, they talked, they've talked. they always talked about that. Yeah, and, and you're right. White noise is perfect. exactly how I started to feel about it. You know, and then all of a sudden that happens. And then I thought to myself, wow, I don't have a plan. I haven't really talked to my kids. If, if this does happen, do we have a meeting place? Do we have a 72-hour kit? Do, am I going to be... Well, there's there's that and the wind and the windstorms that came this year knocked out power. So all those things are kind of relevant to do we have a disaster plan for ourselves and our family? You know, and so I think it's a good time to take a self stock inventory of okay, because as we're running on autopilot. Majority of Americans have been running on autopilot for the majority of their life. I get yep. up, I go to work, I go to bed, and nothing changes. Uh, you know, some years I'll have good success in money, some years I'll lose, but for the most part, whatever happens, I'm going to be all right. Right, and we haven't had too many major disruptions to that process unless it's our own doing you know yeah but this year we've had earthquakes quakes windstorms riots protests mm-hmm. pandemics uh job loss uh i mean uh, so much uncertainty but here we are standing yeah yeah no i i actually think that a lot of people are starting i see people starting to talk sort of like you're talking today about the fact that as we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel now, I think really having the vaccines hit the street. I've had some friends get the vaccine this last week, and I think that's starting to really open up the end of that tunnel and the light's pouring in and people are starting to have the realizations that you're talking about, which are, huh, I guess I'm a lot stronger than I thought I thought I was. You know, we talk about our grandparents being part of that, what was dubbed the greatest generation, Mm -hmm. but they didn't know they were the greatest generation until they were faced with a a worldwide epidemic of war and and tyranny, right? And they stood up to it. And I kind of like to think that all generations have that potential to stand up to the the conflicts and the challenges that are thrown their way. And granted, it's, it's, I think we're coming towards an end of a really, really crazy year, but I think it it should bolster our sense of self. One thing we talk about in therapy a lot is resistance 
promotes growth. That's sort of a natural science basic law of how the universe works. You know, uh, plants grow up through the soil. Uh, childbirth is difficult. Things that are hard for us to do have the potential for growth. And this year has been a huge potential for growth. And hopefully we can take stock in our own lives and kind of see how we've grown. Now, I'm not going to, I'm going to say this and it's a generalization, but I don't want anyone to take it in a negative way. For the most part, us as Americans take the path of least resistant. I think in large part. Well, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's, I mean, it, I know I do. <laughs> and, and I do, too. And and I've done it for most of my life. Now I don't. Now I, I, I try to go, I wonder what that path is like. Right. And I'm going to give it a shot because now I've tested myself. I've put myself through some duff, difficult situations and come out on the other end. So I know I've got it in me. But before then, I never was really forced to take that test because everything just came easy and I could just do it. So I I never really was forced to do it. Now, through recovery and what I've gone through, I mean, there was times that I was staring. There's like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. I don't think I've got it in me. But every morning I got up, I got out of bed, I put one foot in front of the other. And before I knew it, I had some. Well, specifically, one thing that I've noticed with you, I've been sort of keeping track of this, but you have continued to go to the gym, I think almost every day, yeah. early in the morning, which to me, going to the gym and early in the morning are two of my least favorite things. But I know that's been part of your dedication to your sobriety is getting up and working out and feeling good first thing in the morning, feeling strong and healthy in a, in a good, healthy way. And I think that's been part of But you've done it. I've been noticing you, you've done it ever since uh, our first conversation when you got out of uh, rehab. I haven't missed a week since September 3rd, 2018. Yeah. 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 And here we're coming up, uh, you know, and it's been amazing. It really has been a great journey. But I never was forced to be strong because things just came easy to me until they didn't. And then I had to figure out, do I really have this in me? Is this how my story ends? Do I go, okay, I got beat. And I think that's part of the problem with having things come easy that's i think that's what most of us want right like you when you're a kid growing up you'd kind of like to be the great athlete or the super brain in the class or or the artist or something the the kid who can shred the guitar you know we all kind of want those cool talents and for some of us and you're one of them with with your humor and people skills it just has come naturally for you but that that skips the resistance part a little bit or a lot maybe I mean, it's not that you didn't ever work to get your jobs and all those things. Yeah. Um, but I think it's not until you go through sort of a uh, what they call the refiner's fire, like not until you go through some tough stuff that you really know how you can take those natural abilities up to the next level and really hone them and make them yours. So somebody like you who was just born with a sense of humor, you know how to crack people up and make them laugh. But I think it's the experiences of getting sober of having to really fight for jobs, having to create jobs. I don't think people really understand, since you're on the air, uh, that you've really had to create <laughs> this new phase of your um, of your career, and it hasn't been hasn't been easy. And so I think I think that's made you a funnier person. Um, and I think for all of us this year, if we kind of dig deep and think, well, am I am I not living up to the challenges? Some of us may not be. Mm-hmm. Um, I, are there challenges that I could still jump into and conquer this late in the year? I bet there are. I, I yeah, no, I think I 100 percent agree with you. I mean, I, I was at the gym this morning, and not to bring it back to it, and the the goal was 25, and I got to 25, and he goes, "How many did you do?" I go, "25." He goes, "Could you do more?" And I go, "Yeah, but you said 25." He goes, "Well, why'd you stop?" I said. Because you said because I'm obedient, <laughs> I'm but, tired. But he goes, if you could do more, yeah, do then more, why would not you do yeah. more? He goes, I think we can all do better, and I think yeah. that really goes to everybody. I think we could all do better, but sometimes just doing enough is what we were used to, and so now in sure. my life, I'm not doing just enough. I'm doing a little bit more if I can. Yeah, I think that's a great analogy. Throw up a few extra reps if you can do it uh, in the gym or in life. Yeah, you know, go the extra mile. You're listening to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction, more importantly, about recovery. We'll be right back with me and Dr. Matt. A gun in the face. Then all of a sudden, they all kind of lined up. 
they pointed their guns at me. And this is the point where I thought, I'm going to die today. Started two years of horror for an American in Venezuela. They said, you need to give us your phone and get ready because you're coming with us. I'm Becky Bruce, and I spent a year researching and piecing together Josh and Tammy Holt's story about their ordeal in a notorious prison. That's when everything started to turn bad. We had another pound on the door. Boom, boom, boom. And there was the police once again. You can binge all of the episodes of Hope in Darkness on kslpodcasts.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Project Recovery Podcast, a podcast about addiction. More importantly, it's about recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's clinical psychologist Dr. Matt Woolley, uh, the man who's responsible for getting me to read. <laughs> How's that going? You know, it's it's pretty good. So I'm currently in the 10,000 hour, hours uh, chapter. Right. And it's Sir Malcolm Gladwell. It's uh, the outliers. Outliers, yep. And, uh, you know, not to bore anybody, but the way that uh, he looks at a problem mm-hmm. is so interesting. You know, he's an interesting guy, he, and he's fun to read. He's a good writer. So the first chapter, uh, just to, to, to let people know if you haven't read it yet, uh, is he talks about how he looked at this hockey roster. And uh, mm-hmm. all the greatest hockey players yep. were born between January and March. Uh-huh. And uh, these were the guys that went on. And everybody thought that this was going to be some cool thing because of... You know, it had to do their zodiac, or the parents were getting together. <laughs> Something magical, right? But the reality was, is the cutoff date for the kids to be a certain age to play at that certain level exactly was January first or something like that. So, and all the kids who were born right in that month were, were the bigger, taller, faster kids for the most part, yeah. because they were. They were older. older. Yeah, yeah, it makes total sense. Right? And so then after the fourth grade, they got this imprint on their brain that they're bigger and better right. and started getting the better coaching, the better ice get, time. Yeah, all that stuff. It all kind of it, it snowballs so, in a positive way. So, so it didn't have so much to do with the fact that they had this innate athletic ability, which a lot of them did have, but a lot of people do. It's yeah. just that they were born at a certain time of year and – Right, and and it, it begs the question. Like you think about the the premier athletes of our time, you know, and the Michael Jordans or the whomever, and you think about like, well, how many other people out there when they were twelve years old had that same athletic potential, but didn't get the right breaks? They weren't the oldest. They they were a little smaller than their teammates, or they didn't. You know what I mean? All those things that he talks about in that book, and you're like, maybe someone else could have stepped, but. You know, but if I want to apply that to my own life, I mean, some of my best friends, including you, everyone I know are hilarious guys, very funny. And when I sit down and uh, like my little brother can make me laugh more than anybody I know, he can always make me laugh and he'll go around and tell everybody I'm the funniest Scott. He's just the only one that got the TV and the radio job. But the reality is, is that I was lucky enough to get certain breaks Mm -hmm. and be able to capitalize on them. It's not because I was funnier than somebody else. I was in the right place at the right time. Yep. Uh, I, you know, and, and, there, uh, there and don't was, you see that a lot in comedians' families when they talk about their, like, if you see an interview with a comedian, they'll say, "Oh, my sister's funnier than I am," or oh, "My yeah. dad's funnier than I am," and it's, 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 but they weren't in the right place at the right time. So luck plays a big part in all of it, and I'm not going to sit here and say that I haven't fought for my sobriety. Sure. But I've also been fortunate and lucky enough to have certain things happen that allow me to keep going. And, and, I, and I don't negate those. I, 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 those. Those are 100% I'm grateful for. Yeah. But not everybody's so lucky. Yeah. Well, not everybody is so lucky. I think I think where I depart a little bit with the Gladwell book, I, I really enjoyed it. It's a great book. If you haven't read it, it's been out for at least a decade. So people ought to go read it. Um, and it gives you an interesting perspective on success. It really does. But I also, and I don't think he is necessarily saying this next thing I'm going to say isn't true either. But regardless of where you're at and what your, um, what your breaks have been, you're still, you know, the captain of your own destiny. You still can make things happen for yourself. And I do think that there is a direct correlation between effort and luck, meaning the more effort you put in there, the more you get out and test things and do things, the luckier, so to speak, that you get. 
for example, you know everybody. Like I don't, <laughs> our listeners should go spend an afternoon walking around Salt Lake City with Casey Scott because he knows everybody. It's really fun to walk into a place with you because everybody's like, oh, Casey. You know? And so you could argue that, hey, if Casey needed a job, he's already got this network of people out there. But that's because you've been out there all these years talking to people. You talk to everybody and not everybody knows you, but you'll talk to everybody. Mm -hmm. And so that's a good example of somebody being kind of the master of their own of their own destiny. Um, Actually, this just right now reminds me of a story I used you in therapy uh, last week as an example. Awesome. You want to hear it? Yes. (laughs) So there's this guy I've been working with and he um, got passed over for a promotion at his job and for all intents and purposes I agree with him he really probably should have got it but it was one of those uh, family political things he works for a company that's not totally owned by a family but partially managed by one family and a little nepotism a a little nepotism a cousin got the job and and I I hate to agree with people because I don't want to just be that therapist who says oh yeah you should have got it most of the time I'm saying well (laughs) you probably shouldn't have uh, let's talk about what you can do to get it. But in this case, he probably should have got it. And he was very discouraged, very down, which is a risk factor for him. And we were talking and he was saying, I just, I just, every time an opportunity presents itself now, I just don't say anything. I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, I'll be in a meeting or I'll have an opportunity to talk to one of the up, upper up people. And I just, I'm so discouraged. I'm just not going to say anything. And I said, well, you, you listen, he listens to this show. I said, well, you've listened to our show. And I said, do you know, do you remember the story about how Casey got the show? And he said, no, actually, I I don't remember that. And I said, well, you know, Casey was getting fired in one breath. You know, he got out of rehab and KSL was nice to to sit down with him and and thank him. But they said, we just can't keep you on on the air. Like, you know, just not going to work, obviously. And and you went into that meeting. Everybody's heard this story. But then I said, in the very next breath, he pitched this show. (laughs) And in fact, they were so surprised. They're like, wait a second. Are you telling me that that we're firing you and you're asking for a job at the same time? And you were like, yeah. And he's like, he did not. And I'm like, oh, yeah, go back and listen to the episodes. 100%. Yeah, we've talked about It's exactly how this show came to be and, frankly, how everything Casey's doing has come to be because this show is the first. Now he has another show and other things are happening. But it all came down to him at that moment kind of pushing a boundary. He could have easily – I mean, you're getting fired. Has anyone ever been fired? It's a horrible – well, I don't don't know if I've ever been fired. But it's a horrible feeling. And and, uh, being let go, and and you would think that's – if there's ever been a good excuse to – Go, you know, do the Charlie Brown walk out of the building and go home right and feel sorry for yourself. Get a 12-pack. Yeah, that's the time. But he asked for it. So anyway, he said, really, he didn't. I said, yeah. So what, what, what we did is we talked about how regardless of how discouraged you feel and justified in your discouragement, are you willing to still push those boundaries to get what you want, to be the captain of your destiny? And I think this year is a perfect example of a lot of people. Man, I just know so many people that have lost their business. Uh, they've been reduced hours. They've been uh, they've had family members lost because of covid or dramatically impacted by that. Um, it's easy to feel discouraged this year. And I think think that story was it was inspirational to my patient. And I, and I think it's hopefully inspirational to our uh, our listeners. But yes, the 10th. I'm glad you're reading. <laughs> and, and, and you sent me a cool picture of you and uh, and Bowden. You gave uh, my son a, the, a graphic novel graphic of, no, of Lord the, of the Rings. The Hobbit. Yeah. The Hobbit, which I think is a beautifully done. It's a beautiful uh, graphic novel. Um, and you guys are reading. And so it's interesting to learn that, but it's also, I think, good to say. But regardless, even though I was born in November, maybe I still could be a professional athlete. So here's, here's kind of where I take with that. Um, for the longest time, in my career, in the story of Casey Scott and all the things I've done. I've done a lot of cool stuff. I've done a lot of bad stuff. Um, I always thought somebody else was writing my book. And I was just a character in it. And it was like one of those choose-your-own endings. You know what I mean? I remember those. And and so it was kind of like, I'm presented with this situation, so do I take this? If not, I go here, and I do that. 2020 has taught me that I'm the author of my own story. I get to dictate where it goes. I get to choose what I want to be. I remember when I was sitting there in rehab and thinking to myself, 
this is not how my story ends. This is not the end. And Casey did all this cool stuff, had a great job, a great family and all that stuff. And then he threw it away. The end. Yeah. I go, that's not. No, I, I'm not happy with that. And so when I came to KSL and they said, do you, no, we can't have you work here. Okay. Well, then I got to find something and I'm going to do something that I'm passionate about and something that I want to do. So I really took over the narrative of my life and which is sad because I'm 46, but for the longest time I let, but who cares? Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, I think taking over, I think that's a beautifully, beautiful statement, taking over the narrative of your life. I love that. It's poetic. But who cares the age? Because sometimes we can't do that until we have the experience and the introspection, right? And and we'd like to think we live in this sexy society where everybody's super successful when they're 22 years old and they're good looking and they're calm, you know. But that's BS, of course, because most people are not, and that's just what people throw out on social media um, and and celebrities and things. But but the world isn't that way. You need experience. I I think in the old days we valued. Um, the, the kind of the wise older person a little bit more. When we talk about the hero's journey, which we talk about sometimes here. Yeah. The hero doesn't make it through the journey without, without their, their guide. And their guide is usually almost entirely a wise old man or a wise old woman. It's who's a, been there, done been that. And they're done that. They have the wisdom, the experience. They're your Gandalf. They can take you through what you need to go through. And so, yeah, 46, that's the best. Yeah. But, you know, but when you think about that wise old sage or that person who's on this journey with you, the importance of that that sage or that person is to let you live your life because they can't shield you from everything. Right. There's some lessons that need to be learned the hard way. As an adult, as an parent, you want to be able to keep your kid away from that hot stove and you hope they listen. But everybody's got that one kid that goes, what do you mean it's hot? How? It's hot. <laughs> I try to tell you. Wait, is it still hot? <laughs> yeah, you know, but so, but, but in the hero's journey, that's exactly what happens. The, eventually they leave you alone. You're on your own. If you look at that circle, of the journey at the bottom, you're on your own and, and you hopefully have learned from those people that have given you advice and given you guidance so that you can be the wise person at the end of your journey. So here I am in halftime in my life and uh, a lot of the stuff that I thought I was wronged at in my early career and all that, uh, some of it was and some of it wasn't. Some of it was my own fault and some of it was circumstances. But I can now look back and go, I learned this from him. I learned what mm-hmm. not to do from this guy. <laughs> and and that's that. just as important as learning what to do. Oh, definitely. How to treat people. Yeah. What to do. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's why I think I've got somewhat of a longevity in this career. It's it's because I've I've been a student. And it go back to Malcolm Gladwell, the 10,000 hours. Oh, yeah. You know, practice, it, practice, 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 practice. And, you know, when I sit down in front of a mic, I feel comfortable. I remember people were like, hey, do you still get nervous? Yeah, I do get nervous. But I'm also confident in my ability that I can get through this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, it, and, it, and it's great. And so I think that's what I really enjoy about 2020 and these, you know, two plus years of sobriety and recovery is that. I am now the master of my own domain. I get to decide where I want to go. I, if you want, if I want to be funny, I'll be funny. If I don't, I don't. I I don't have to be. Yeah, be- we've talked a lot about that because I think when you were younger, and I think a lot of people who are in the media in some way or another, when they're kind of a public persona, you kind of feel like you have to be on. And I don't think the rest of us who we don't do the, the jobs like you guys do. Um, there's there's a little more to it than that. It's sort of like if I'm not on all the time, I could lose my edge. I could I my stock could go down and then someone's going to replace me because what people don't know is on the radio, on TV, in podcasting, everybody's quickly replaceable, right? The next big thing, the the executives are always looking for the next big thing. And so if you're not staying relevant, then you could be out, you could walk, get your pink slip tomorrow. And so I think you, you feel this tremendous pressure to be funny and to be on all the time, even if you're just wanting to have a burger at a restaurant with your family. Or going shopping. The scariest part in TV and radio uh, industry is when you go on vacation. Because it's always living and breathing. Somebody's always got to be there doing your job. So if you take a week off, that means they're going to find somebody to do your job for a week. Oh, yeah. 
what if that guy's better? Right. What if that guy's funnier? What if they can get him cheaper? That's why you don't see a lot of people in the news industry taking time off. That's a good point. I mean, it, 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 I mean, it really is scary. Yeah, I'm sure. because all of a sudden you come back and go, "Wow, that guy was pretty funny," and you know what I mean, and had a different take on it. Yeah, and so it's it's nerve wracking. Oh, I'm sure it is. And so, but, it, but I so think, why are you able to sort of put that aside now? Because I think knowing you pre you know sobriety and now post sobriety uh, now you're kind of different you you're more confident i think you're just as funny as you've always been but but you know i you're not uh, i think begging to give people an opportunity to laugh at you honestly i can tell you do you want to know why yeah because what i do doesn't define me who i am defines me does that make sense so i've lost the radio job. I've lost the TV job, and I'm still who I am. More than one TV job. Yeah, I've, yeah. I mean, I've <laughs> lost multiple. I've lost more jobs in the entertainment than people have had. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I just did a podcast with two girls who are doing my old job. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, and I'm so. But, I forgot about but that. But that's the thing is that it, it. I'm confident with who I am. Yeah. And if I get back on TV, great. If I don't, no big deal. Because I had a good run, and there's more out there for me to do. There's other things. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. And for the longest time, I wasn't okay with that because I was who I thought I was when I was on TV. And the truth is, I hate to tell you people, that was an exaggeration of who I am. Sure. And I tried to be that guy all the time, and it got me in trouble. Yeah. And I don't want to be in trouble anymore. And that, you know, I think... Uh, when we allow things outside of who we are to define us, whatever it is, whatever you're, if, you, if it's being the big businessman in your town or whatever your profession happens to be, anything outside of you, if you let that define your core, then you're always chasing it. And it's always fickle and under someone else's control. It's, in, it, it's, it's not as um, solid. And so when you can realize that I am who I am, I I am defining myself, and therefore I confidently go into doing the things I do, but that's not who I am, that's a much more secure place to be in life. Are you ready for your mind to be blown? Yes. I was addicted to being popular. It's just like any addiction. It takes control over you. I wondered if you'd ever say that. Yeah. You've never said that. Why well, it just it just popped into my head, yeah. but I was addicted to being the guy on TV. Yeah. I was addicted to the people thinking, "Hey, you're so funny that we wake up every morning," and it was a great feeling. But it's just like any other addiction, whether it's alcohol, opioids, heroin, substance. I was addicted, and I let that control my life. Oh yeah, I thought that's what I needed. Now here at 46, two years sober, that's not what I need. You know what I need? I need a good community. I need relationships with my kids. I need relationships with my pe- family. And if I've got all that other stuff that I'm secure at home, then I can go figure out what I want to do out there. I thought I had all that stuff because I was that guy. Mm-hmm. That's right. not the truth. Right. right. I was addicted to it. And do you feel like that was ever – like how did you address that? So it's easier to address in a way the alcohol because it's a substance. It's tangible. You can talk about it. But what you're talking about is a, is a behavior. It's a mindset. It's, it's an, you're addicted to a certain way of thinking, and that's not very tangible. I was, it was easy because it was all taken away. Yeah. It was all taken away. In, in, a, in a flash, it was gone. Yeah. And there was nothing I could do to get it back. And maybe the mugshot that you joke around with is um sort of the tangible example of that, right? It is. That that's the moment when it went away. I'm not gonna lie to you. I Google myself about once a month. Do you? Yeah. Just and I wanna one, I wanna see if whatever I'm doing now pops up above the mugshot. But right now, the mugshot's still number one. Is it really? It's still number one. <laughs> and that's okay, because I look at that guy, and I don't want to be that guy anymore. Yeah. And I won't be. But I was. Yeah. You know? And, and, and I've got I've to be okay with that. I wonder how many of us are just mugshots waiting to happen. More I than wonder you- how many people listening to the show, any of us, are we doing things that are heading us in that direction? Are we just mugshots waiting to happen? 
That's yeah. an interesting thought. And I think if you want to do self introspection, it would scare you. Yeah. Well, that that would make you take stock of like, huh, what are my behaviors? What am you know? How am I spending my time? What am I valuing? You know, am I heading down a road that ends in a literal or a proverbial mugshot? So in 2020, I've got a great relationship with my kids. They're my best friends. I've got a wonderful girlfriend. Yep. I got an ex-wife who I enjoy. Who invites you in for sandwiches. Yeah. And <laughs> I can't imagine my life being any better. So I'm grateful. I'm thankful for you. For Josh, for KSL, for Channel 2, for all my life experiences, because I am a total of all of those. And my story's not done. My story's not over. And I don't know where it's going, but I'm excited. I really am excited. Like I said, I'm at halftime of life. Well, that's a great way to look at it. I mean, Janet Jackson is dancing. (laughs) <laughs> oh, no. let's, let's pick a different halftime show okay. Aerosmith is playing there you go. Run DMC is going to do Walk This Way Oh that's a good one And we're going to start the second half and I'm excited but And I can a- tell you right now It's a tie score Yeah, I haven't won and I haven't lost Well that's a great way to look at it It's a great analogy because what do you do at halftime You go in you make adjustments um, If you for, for the psychology nerds out there If you look at Erickson's stages of psychological development Midlife is that pivot point. It's a time that nobody can escape. When you're in your, you know, 40s and 50s, that's a time where a person naturally pauses and says, "Huh, I'm not a kid anymore. I've kind of done all the big grown-up stuff, right? I, I went, you know, I, I graduated from high school, went to college. I probably got married and had some kids. I've had a career or two. You know, I'm getting I got kicked a, out of Midnight Oil's dressing room for drinking all their beer. Yeah, well, some some of us have, some of us haven't. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll let the listeners guess which one of us it was. It was me. Yeah. Um, and uh, and you know, it's that time where people naturally reflect and. When you really dig deep and have introspection, the reflection leads to behavior change and improvement. It's a very exciting time of life. We we talk about the midlife crisis as being a negative thing because there is that. But most people, if you look around, if you look at if you look at your friends and family, your neighbors, most people in their forties and fifties are making some, albeit probably subtle, but exciting changes. They're saving money better. They're getting their career more where they want it to be. Their their health is improving. They're doing things to make their – they're making that pivot to head in the direction they want to go in. Sometimes we we stumble, and midlife can be the time when – when you make some bad decisions because you're you're afraid and you don't know how to move forward and there's help for that you know go talk to somebody about it if you're in your midlife and you feel like this isn't a time that you're heading in the right direction because it can be so i love that analogy of halftime because that's really how we work psychologically is you can't escape your midlife reflection time it can turn into a crisis or it can turn into this new direction that leads you in to becoming the person you always wanted to be i say my midlife crisis turned into a midlife awakening there you go and like you it. know it really was i mean uh you know the crisis was horrible and it was bad but i used that to awaken and figure out what's really important and what do i want yeah and now i have the ability the mindfulness, uh, the wherewithal to go out and get it. And I've got the ability. It's up to me whether I want to get it. Isn't it funny that, and I don't think any of us are immune to this for sure, because it's it's so, you know, it, you don't know it until it happens. But all this introspection, all this behavior change, I mean, uh, do you think that car accident had to happen for this to happen? Because, it, I mean, we'll never really know. But I mean, you got divorced. That didn't really do it. You know, you got you got let go. I remember talking to you when you got let go at, at Channel Two. I was kind of relieved because I was like, I don't love doing TV. I was doing TV because I got to hang out with you, yeah. and Debbie. Right? Um, I love radio. I love podcasting. I was doing TV with you guys because I was like, well, I get to see Casey and Debbie. And I was like, when you got fired, I was like, oh, good. I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um and uh and 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 that didn't really do it. I mean, isn't it funny how it, we, it's hard ask, to predict people what, ask what's going to make all us the change. Time. And the re, and the truthful answer is I wish it didn't happen. Yeah. But I don't know if I'd be here today if it did. 
didn't. Right, right. You know what I mean? Right. I was on this other podcast the other day talking about it, and one one benefit of everything that I've gone through is my kids are going to be warriors. My kid got my kids got an education, and uh, uh, they've had to face the music with what what addictive behavior can do to your life and they didn't even do it yeah that's what i'm saying and they're gonna be warriors they know more than they should know about this at their young age and i wish that they didn't but the reality is i can't go back and change that but maybe if more kids their age knew the reality of this there would be more um there would be better decisions being made as we got older i don't know yeah so i mean i i don't know if i would be here if it wasn't for that accident yeah to be honest with you, 100%. Do I wish the accident never happened? Of course. 100%. Of course. But it's just interesting, right? It's interesting that anybody can sit and ask themselves the same question. Yours is dramatic because it was a car accident and it was on TV and there's a mugshot and all of that. And I could have killed mean, people. You could have killed people and thank goodness uh, there, were, there weren't those kinds of injuries in that accident. Um, but all of us, I mean, do we need, are we waiting for a crisis? Like, do we have to have an accident or some some crisis in life to to make these these huge changes that we want to make or can we make them just based on insight or by learning from other people i hope that this podcast helps people learn from from the stories that our guests bring on from the stories that you share I hope that's enough for most of us to to kick it into gear, but I know it it isn't always. Everybody's different uh, in the insight that you bring to every podcast. If we can go back to a couple of guests ago, Tyson Dixon from Renaissance Ranch. Right. Remember, he was talking about how he's lived this life and his wife has never done any alcohol, never done any drugs. Right, nothing. But he said something from wisdom and – you you guys had this this heady conversation about there's some people like me that have to learn the hard way and right. there's other people that go oh no I just I saw what you guys did I don't right. want to do that right in the business we call that vicarious learning or learning by observing that it's kind of a higher order learning um, I had a graduate professor actually he was this funny guy I really liked him because he was very relatable he grew up on a farm and and, uh, and he was now this very well-known professor and he was the youngest of five boys and he said oh yeah vicarious learning happened all the time around our farm because I just got to see my older brothers tick off my dad and I knew I never wanted to do that <laughs> so he'd change his behaviors because they'd get you know the belt I assume or something and so so sometimes we do learn by by observing and that's the best Best kind of learning, I think, but sometimes we have to learn by by our own mistakes, by behaviors too. Sometimes we have to touch that handle to see if it's hot. But you you can reflect on that. That's the thing. That's where I hope people will listen to this show sometimes and go, "Wait, am I learning from my? Am I actually learning from my mistakes, or am I just burning my fingers? Mm-hmm. Right? Like, am I pausing and really, you know, digesting what's happening and like where this is taking me in my life? Like, um, you know, I'm sure there are people listening to this show. Who drink and drive. Yeah. How many times have you almost been in an accident because of your you're intoxicated while you're driving? Do you have to get in the accident to make you stop doing that? Or can you think, oh, crap, last night, I can't believe I made it home alive and I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't wreck my car. Nobody knows. But is that enough? Can you learn from that or do you have to crash that car? I don't know. Yeah. And I don't know the answer to that either, but I think there's a lot of people making that. And that's why I think this podcast is so powerful because people come on and share their stories. And I think it's in the stories that people who are listening to go, oh, I'm close to that. Or I don't want to get that bad. So hopefully they can vicariously learn through these podcasts and realize I don't need to go that far. But if I've seen all these people and heard all these people and where their story goes – Right, But the other part of the podcast is to see where these people have been mm-hmm. and where they are, because mm-hmm. there have been so many great stories of hope and inspiration. We talked about it last week, where it, it, it's a Disney movie on drugs. <laughs> I mean, that's what it is. It really is. I mean, you know, when you, when you count this guy out and then all of a sudden he's back on top and he's doing wonderful things because he did the work. Mm-hmm. He took control of his life and he got things in order. Well, think about... Uh, Roseanne, our guest last last week, right? Uh-huh. Roseanne, um, she, would you have ever looked like he, she looked 
like she was ready to go model. Yeah. Like, I mean, she she had beautiful a Beautiful nice, young lady. Be, she was beautiful, but it was like she had a glow about her. She was happy and vivacious and healthy. And to hear her story. 18 months in prison. Oh, my goodness. And to know what, what that must have done. I, I bet we wouldn't even recognize a picture of her from those low days compared to now. And how cool is that? that she's been able to get her life to where it is today. So those kinds of stories are very inspirational. I hope they they make they help people make changes in their own life without them also having to learn from their own behaviors. Learn from our guests. Well, I learn from you daily. I learn from Josh. I learn from everybody. I'm a student of the game of life, and I really enjoy it. So we want to say thank you for stopping by and listening to the podcast today. I want to I want to stop. Ooh. I want to stop before we sign off. I want to thank Josh. Josh, it's fun today being back in the studio. Well, we've been, so we were at, we were at home for a while. We uh-huh. were doing the Zoom things. Yep. And then they said, well, we if, here in the big studio, um, we could have three people for because distancing. Because six feet apart. Right, six feet apart distancing. And that meant if you and I are in the room and a guest's in the room, no Josh in the room. No Joshy. And so Josh would he would he would sadly walk past the window with head down and Charlie Brown music going back over to his desk. You Just know. thinking of all the ways I'm screwing up the audio. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then Casey's in here looking like he knows what he's doing, but I don't. Uh, I, <laughs> you pulled it off. But isn't it fun to have Josh back in the studio with us? And and just like all the rest of us, Josh has had a few you know hills and valleys. Yep, gutters and strikes. This year, and I just want to—I want to tell Josh, this show wouldn't be anything without Josh. We love him. Yep, you, he was the missing piece. Definitely. Well, we we started off, and we had we had John Smith, who's great, and and we had you know a few other things going on in the early times. But you know, when you just kind of get the chemistry right, and yeah, Josh is anyway. I just want to tell Josh, I appreciate him, and and we want to wish everybody out there a Merry Christmas. Right. Uh, this is going to come out after Christmas, so let's look forward to a happy new year. Right, definitely. It's going to be a great new year. Um, and I, actually, I think it's reframing. It's all how you look at things. This year has been a dumpster fire. It has been one thing after another. It's also been exciting, mm-hmm. crazy, mm-hmm. and the best opportunity to learn and grow that we've had from the easy years that preceded it. Have you ever seen the thing about craziness as related to a hot chick? Oh, tell me. Uh, so there's, there's, we didn't learn about this in grad school. The hotter she is, the crazy she is. Oh, is that right? And then there's a sliding scale of all that stuff. You Google it sometime. <laughs> okay. But I just wanted to tell you, if 2020 yeah. was a girl, she'd be hot as heck. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's been bananas. I can see that. Hey, thank you for listening to Project Recovery, brought to you by our friends at knowyourscript.org. If you know somebody battling uh, on, with opioids, have them go check it out. There's a lot of great information and resources. Project Recovery is a KSL podcast. of this program are for informational purposes only. The program is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician, licensed therapist, or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this program. KSL does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, physicians, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned on the program. Reliance on any information provided on the program is solely at your own risk. I'm Dave Cauley, investigative journalist and host of the podcast, Cold. In October of 1985, a woman named Cherie Warren left work at a busy Salt Lake City office. To meet her estranged husband at a downtown auto dealership. She never made it home. Cherie's car surfaced weeks later in Las Vegas. In the parking lot of a hotel casino. No one knows how it got there. Strange. It was strange. Both Cherie's estranged husband and her boyfriend raised suspicion for investigators. I kind of thought that he might have done something. But no arrests were ever made. 
In Cold Season 3, we dig into double lives, make new connections in the case, and examine the difficulty raised by reasonable doubt. We want answers just as much as anyone else. They have creeps like that now too, so nothing's changed. That's the new Cold Season 3, The Search for Cherie. Now available anywhere you get your podcasts.